Welcome back, everybody, to Disclosure Team. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, um, I've actually switched my shows at the moment to Sundays, and unfortunately, Katie is unable to join me on Sundays. So I'm going to be back on Wednesday with Katie, and then next Sunday, I think she may be able to join me. But if you keep your eye on the channel and on our social medias, you'll be able to keep up to date with what's coming up. Um, and before I bring on my guest, please um, keep the live chat respectful both to each other and towards our guest. And if you do have any questions, please pop them in capital letters. It gives me a better chance of seeing them in the live chat. And if you wanted to support the channel, then Super Chats are open as well. I cannot guarantee I will be able to ask every question. I've got obviously my set list of questions and we'll see how long the interview goes on for. But I'm really excited for this one. We've got lots to get through. So let's not waste any more time and welcome my guest, John Ramirez. John, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And thanks for having me, Vinny. I know uh, we have uh, spoken before and I wasn't able to come on your show. And I'm glad that I'm here now because we are in the pre-disclosure era. Yes, so it seems. And, uh, you know, you've made this point in, in the last few interviews that you've done. And we'll we'll get to that in, in a little while. But I wanted to start off with something that's been happening in the last couple of days. And this was something that you first brought up on the uh, Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. And it's regarding Anjali and that she claimed to have been interviewed by the UAP task force back in 2021 and 2022. And we then saw a statement um, through Tim McMillan at the debrief from Jay Stratton, the former head of the UAP task force, saying that he was not aware of, or there were no interviews with Anjali during his time at the UAP task force. She then clarified on Twitter that it was UAP DOD investigators that she had spoken to who then reported back to the UAP task force. So I just wondered if you could help clear this up to some degree. Is, is there a separate group other than UAP task force with some investigators looking into UAP? How can we kind of make sense of what's been going on? Well, Angela and I will be appearing in a podcast uh, toward the end of this month, later in May. And we hope to clarify all of those questions in a way that everyone would understand exactly my context and Anjali's context, as well as, to his credit, Jay's context, because what we all said was absolutely true. And what needs to be sorted out is the relationships between the UAP task force, what it was about, and those who supported the task force. And I'm able to provide some background information on how that mechanism actually worked back in the day. And so stay tuned for that. Okay, no, that, I had to ask, so I appreciate that. And so everybody, you know, look out for the, the podcast coming up where we will get the clarification on that. But thank you, John, I really appreciate that. Uh, and sticking with the UAP task force, have you spoken with the task force yourself or you know, it's uh, reiterations, you know, AIM, SOG or ARO, either on the record or off the record regarding this subject? I was given uh, direct uh, contact information to reach uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick. However, I decided not to do so because what he knows and what information he has been able to gather from both current and former officers of the military and civilian intelligence community is probably far more extensive than what I am able to offer. And I am sure that he is aware of what I've said publicly in the public domain. And I am sure that, uh, that uh, he has received information from others uh, with whom I've spoken with in private. And so with all of that information, I don't see why he would you know, be interested in anything I would have to say above and beyond. Um, so I think he has all the information um, even at a um, classified level that I can't say in public, I believe he has that information as well. Do you think he may not be limited to some degree because he's only running under Title 10 authorities and doesn't yet have Title 50 authorities, which would allow him to access more data? Well, I believe, uh, in fact, uh, th that might be the reason why um, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence uh, had a letter written uh, about having other provisions of the legislation carry forward and they're waiting on those provisions to be carried forward and that letter was signed by both the uh, current chair uh senator mark warner of virginia and his vice chair senator marco rubio of florida 
And if you read that letter carefully, it's outlined many of the things that the legislation called for that have not yet been implemented. And why is that? And so I do believe that, um, you know, the arrow itself, it, it, people have to understand arrow itself is not a disclosure kind of effort by the government. It is basically designed for aviation safety and to consider any national security implications as well, in addition to aviation safety. And by aviation safety, it's not just our military pilots or the military pilots of our close allies, like, like the RAF, for example, but also civilian aviation as well. And so um, that is the scope of Errol. It is mostly, um, the hearings are mostly about uh, what we called um, oversight. Yeah. That is the, the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee wanted to know, you know, do you have the resources necessary to do your job? Uh, do you have the staffing necessary to do your job? And to your point, Vinny, do you have the cooperation of the what we call the interagency to do your job? The interagency being the other alphabet soup agencies that may have information about the UAP issue. Do you have all of those resources? And he did state that, um, you know, that's that's something of a challenge, uh, especially toward Title 50, which is CIA mostly. Yeah. And certain aspects of the civilian intelligence community. Um, so I know that gets lost and it gets into a lot of um, technicalities in terms of how the uh, U.S. government is, I would say, disorganized in some aspects. And uh, well, Title 50 is definitely the Department of Defense Uniformed Services. So it's like our Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and Space Force. That's Title 10. And Title 50 is the civilian side of all of that under the ODNI. And, you know, the alphabet soup agency, CIA, and also NSA, NRO, NGA, DIA, all of that is also under Title 50. So if I was a, um, if I, if I were a um, NRO employee and I wore a uniform, let's say it is an Air Force uniform, well, I fall under Title 10. But if I work for NRO and I wear a suit, to work every morning, I fall under Title 50. And that's just the way it is. So you can imagine that there's both cooperation and competition that uh, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick has to face in order to get the information from where he needs it. Um, because I personally believe that the Air Force might be very reluctant to share its information. Now, not that it doesn't want to, but I personally believe that they may have um, equities that they need to protect. And what are those equities? So it could be that they were able to um, take the technology, let's say metamaterials or maybe parts or whole craft, take that technology and not necessarily reproduce that technology because you know we don't have the metamaterials that we can manufacture here on this planet, uh, but able to derive some of that technology and adapt it for human use, adapted for what the Air Force wanted it for. And as you know, you people have witnessed these triangles mm. and people have called them TR-3B, uh, Black Mantra, whatever you want to call it. Um, but regardless of what it's named, um, the question to ask is never talk to a DOD person using nomenclature because that nomenclature may have been out in social media and that might not be the real nomenclature. And a DOD person will answer the question literally and not offer anything of an explanation. So if you ask, so let's say there is that triangle craft somewhere. And it just let's say. Yeah. And you know, you talk to a DOD and say, hey, you know, tell us about your TR3B black mantra triangle craft. And the DOD person says there's no such thing. And is that DOD person lying? No, because the DOD person knows that that is not the actual nomenclature for that craft. And in fact, you know, it puzzles me that I know there's a TR-1, uh, which is a modification of the new two aircraft. It's still flying since 1955. It's still in the air and it's still going to be in the air for in the future. And there is a uh, upgrade to this, a dramatic upgrade called the TR-X 
with the X not being a number. So is there a TR aircraft in the future that will be used as a spy plane and it may have some extraordinary technology on board? Well, if the DOD person was honest, the DOD person will say yes. And is that a secret? No, because the Air Force released the information about the TRX um, at one of these U.S. Air Force Association meetings where they bring Air Force equities and the defense contractor equities together to have an open symposium out in the public domain. Uh, so it's no secret that there's a TRX, but I've never heard of a TR-3B or 3A or 3. Yeah. I've never heard of a TR-2, but I have heard that there was something flying in the aerospace domain that is of extraordinary technology that can get to places on the earth very quickly and have persistent coverage over an area of interest and not be seen. Wow. So I'm not going to reveal like what it is, because I really don't know. Uh, but I have heard that such a thing, the fact of that such a thing does exist. So is that something the Air Force want to, wants to keep hidden? Uh, probably the answer is yes. And rightly so, because any information about that capability on behalf of the US government and our allies like the UK, we don't want that to be uh, leaked to our adversaries at all. I mean, we don't want uh, the Russians to know about this aircraft and be able to know enough about it that they might develop a way to detect it, for example. And so that's why there's so much secrecy uh, surrounding a lot of this UAP issue. It's not the fact that something crashed from some other planet, uh, but it's the fact that, you know, it's the technology derived from what, what crashed from that other planet. And so any talk about that craft from the other planet might lead to what we were able to adapt as a military capability. So that's what they're protecting. Now, I personally believe that the era of secrecy about that should, should be over. It right. really should be over. Um, because like, if it's a planetary, off-planet technology, um, that technology belongs to humanity as a whole, and it should not belong to any particular government that seemed to have acquired that technology because it landed on its sovereign territory. It should be shared with everyone because all the military is going to do is, is to make a capability that's a weaponized capability for it. Well, what about, like, can it solve energy problems? You know, is there a technology there that can help humanity? I would think there is technology that can help humanity. And, and for me, that's that's hiding it is, I wouldn't say it's a criminal offense. Like if no crimes were like committed in the hiding of the technology, in fact, there, there are uh, executive orders and US law, US code that allows the Pentagon to have these types of saps that are, un, uh, that are waived and unacknowledged. Um, it's all written in executive orders. And so, but beyond that, you know, fine. If the, the actual technology itself is from elsewhere and it belongs to all the entire planet. And I'm sure like there's probably Russian uh, technology like that uh, from off world. There are probably other countries with off world technology, particularly Latin America, uh, for example. So, that's my feeling is that it should all be released to the world under the UN auspices. Um, for example, uh, San Marino, we heard of a San Marino and project Titan, yep. uh, putting it under the UN umbrella. And I think countries of the world will then after the U S takes its lead, um, and doing this initial disclosure of that. Yes, it's off world technology. That is it's non-human technology that we're seeing. I think then uh, would be followed by a five eye partners, uh, for example, in the UK and Australia, particularly, um, that they have data. And why do I single out these two and not Canada and New Zealand? Um, well, we all have collection capabilities, but uh, we share a lot of collection capabilities with the UK and with the Australians. As you know, we work closely with um, with Whitehall uh, for the US audience. Whitehall is the Pentagon of the UK. Uh, it's the Ministry of Defense. And we also work with GCHQ, which is the General Communications Headquarters, which is the UK equivalent of the NSA. 
In Australia, we have the Australian Signals Directorate that CIA works with closely at Pine Gap in Alice Springs, Australia. And so with those two principal partners, I'm sure they will have information that they might want to release after our lead. And then that might open the floodgates for countries in Latin America, particularly I would pay attention to Peru and Brazil as having uh, information, if not metamaterials and parts of craft. And so that's what I'm hoping for will happen in the post-disclosure world. So you might need to like change the title of your podcast <laughs> to post-disclosure. Um, yep. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's coming. Uh, I do think it's coming. Yeah, we'll get to that again in a minute. But just sticking with um, both Dr. Kirkpatrick, but also specific wording when asking questions and making statements. During the hearing, when Dr. Kirkpatrick made that statement about there's no evidence to suggest that anything of this is extraterrestrial, yes. do you feel that that was purposefully used as a word to kind of go around the the other possibilities that we all know exist whether they are terrestrial entities of, of non-human intelligence do you think that was planned or do you just think that he was using a broad term what he's saying is that he has photographs and videos and he also has testimony from the military side the title 10 side of people who have witnessed these craft, whether it be pilots or maybe people on the ground. He may have some information from the U.S. Department of Energy National Labs, such as Los Alamos, as an example. And so just based on what he is able to gather, that is the physical evidence he is able to gather, um, just looking at that evidence, aside from anything else he may have access to, that is um, such as CIA legacy program files um, or those of other three letter agencies. Aside from that, just based on what Errol was tasked to do from the time Errol was stood up, is there any evidence just from looking at pictures of metallic spheres flying across the MQ-9 Reaper drone camera? Can you say that that Sphere was extraterrestrial. Well, of course he came. There's nothing that he can say that says, yep, it's extraterrestrial. Um, so in a way, again, I say that folks in the DOD are very, very astute at answering just the question and offering no other amplifying information. So that's what he said. He said that in his opening remarks to, in fact, kind of diffuse any follow-up questions because there were no follow-up questions about what he said. Because if I was on the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, uh, I would ask him that very question you just asked, Vinny, is that, is there evidence of these craft coming out of the ocean and back into the ocean, for example? And there's a, a Mexican researcher named Jaime Massan who has collected a lot of videos of these craft going in and out of like land masses. So are they coming in and out of a land mass? No one followed up on that. And that would make it not extraterrestrial. Um, it would make it what my colleague uh, Jim Simivan has been saying as ultra terrestrial. That is, it's some phenomenon that's associated not off the planet, but on the planet and maybe in the planet, in our oceans. Is it that type of phenomenon? That opens up a whole other avenue of questioning, you know, like, oh, I mean, why are they in our oceans? Were they always here? How long have we known that they've been here? You know, uh, that's not an area that Errol wants to get into. They just want to, like, answer, you know, the aviation safety issue. Um, and but then so again, think, sorry to interrupt, but at the same time, no, if, go ahead. if Dr. Kirkpatrick has had, we're led to believe, almost two dozen witnesses come forward that have worked in some kind of programs, whether it's legacy programs or something mm. to do with uh, retrieved craft, if he gets these reports, yet he doesn't have Title 50 authorities, how is he able to go and verify this information? It almost seems like he would hit a brick wall and not be able to get to that, that information that would clarify the points the witnesses have made. So could that be someone higher up sort of putting Actually, a, a, a yes. stop on it? Yes, and that's where the ODNI 
comes into play. So DNI Averill Haynes has managerial authority over the CIA. The Secretary of Defense has absolutely no managerial authority over CIA. We're independent. CIA is independent from the Department of Defense. Yeah. However, CIA is not independent of the ODNI. So DNI Haynes can compel that cooperation to happen. And I would secondly, I would say <clears throat> that it was very important that the White House took it on as well. And we've heard reports that the National Security Council, who is headed by um, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, has also formed a UAP kind of study. Right. Yeah. But it's not necessarily a research group. It's there more of a managerial kind of traffic cop that, you know, that any kind of like obstacles faced by Errol, um, there you have the supreme authority to get cooperation from anybody in the executive branch of the United States government. And because, you know, Averill Haynes, I said before uh, in other interviews, Averill Haynes wants to talk to President Joe Biden. Does he just show up in her limo? No. Her staff calls his staff and want and would want to know if uh, the president would be free and what time we will be free. What? Give me a date and time because I want to have 15 minutes of his time. That's how Aver Haynes gets to see the president. But Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, he just walks into the Oval Office. Right. <laughs> and to have someone that can walk into the Oval Office who is paying attention to the AP issue is huge. To me, it spoke volumes that this is the one place, the executive office of the president, that can remove any of the stove piping going on within the executive branch over the UAP issue and actually break open any kind of resistance to sharing information because the executive office of the president in the White House can order that information to be shared. And um, your listeners might not know that there's something called original classification authority. The president of the United States, by law, is allowed to declassify anything and everything or to classify anything and everything. It goes both ways. And so it has happened in the past. We used to keep secret the fact that we had photo reconnaissance aircraft. The U-2 and SR-71 at one time was a deep, dark secret, a black program. Um, but President Carter, in a speech, made mention of these photo reconnaissance aircraft that the United States government had. And in that very instant when he said that, that classification was gone. All of it was gone. So it has happened in the past. And so the president can declassify anything. And some people believe that the president isn't told everything. And in a way, that is true but the president is eligible to know everything. And many presidents, they have so much on their plate that as long as they know that someone is working the issue, some of them say, as long as someone's working the issue, I just got to know that there is an issue that somebody's working on. Sure. You don't have to give me details, but somebody's on it. And that would suffice until that issue comes up in the public domain, such as with the balloons. There's an issue that um, a lot of people associated with UAPs, and then that came up in the public domain, in the public narrative, in the media narrative, and the president of the United States had to address that. So there's an issue where that came up all the way up to the president. I believe in the post-disclosure world to come that the next president of the United States in uh, 2024 will be elected as president-elect and will take office in 2025, that the next president will have the opportunity to be the disclosure president. And I have high hopes for that. And so that's part of the reason why I say that disclosure is happening really soon now, because we want that conversation to be part of the political discourse of the United States. So we have this crazy primary system in both parties. And so they run candidates who uh, want to be president in primary races, 
And let's see who survives to the very end. And we sh should have a Democrat and a Republican. Maybe someday we'll have an independent. But right. for now, a Democrat <laughs> and Republican. And so we want that discussion to happen in that primary process in these various states. I would love to see after someone who has um, held an office at a very high position in the executive branch under a former president, let's say, and have that person say, yes, I know that these craft are non-human. Well, if I was a journalist like you, Vinny, I would take your microphone and place it in front of the current office holder of that former position and say, you know, your predecessor said this, and he is in your position for a previous president named the president. What do you know? What right. do you know about this? And, you know, if that person says, I don't know, he's going to look awfully stupid. And if he says there's nothing there, you, you know, he's caught in a lie. So that's why I have high hopes, because once you get people who formerly held these extremely high positions, and I'm not talking about like me or even Jim Semivan, I'm talking about people higher up on the payroll. Um, if these people come forward, it will be a very difficult thing for the current people holding those offices to say there's nothing going on. Something has to be said, especially if the non-human phrase is part of that disclosure discussion. It's non-human. And sir, what do you know? Or ma'am, what do you know about this non-human technology that's flying in our airspace? What do you know all about that? Do you know anything about that? Well, they'll have to like confess they do know something about that. And that is what's going to open up disclosure. And so that's why that's why you're confident in, in what you've been saying about something's coming soon. What was it that, that kind of made you so confident in this? It, 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 let's break it down if, if you can, if you can, and sort of tell us what you can. Well, as it's no secret that a lot of us who were former officers in the intelligence community and in the military have been speaking about this openly. And it's no secret that, you know, people pay attention in government to this. And what I'm hoping is that what we have been saying caught the ears and minds of the current office holders, that they know that we who are, they know we're credible. They can look us up. They know our career history. They know uh, they can look up my career file. They can look at my security file and they would also know that what I was cleared for. It's all in a database that they can access. And we have so many coming forward that it's hard to deny that there's something going on. And I believe that that, in fact, put into the legislation of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence for FY23, they have something called the, not the NDAA, the Intelligence Committees on the House and Senate side they have legislation called the Intelligence Authorization Act. And in that act, they actually said non-human. So they know that what we've been saying has some force and support behind our just mere words. And so I believe that that's where I get my inspiration, that they know that it's non-human. They know it's non-human. And so they want a, a public narrative from the current officials in the U.S. government about this non-human part of the UAP, of this phenomenon. And that's crucial because things flying up in the air, who cares? <laughs> if it's flying up in the air, maybe they're just visiting. <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. You know, maybe it's a, a big rock that's flying through and they're just visiting and they turned around. Um, and I can't pronounce it, but I think it's... a. a Abby Loeb's Amuamua. Amuamua. Thank you very much, Vinny. <laughs> Maybe it's just Amuamua that's flying around. You know, that's fine, you know, but big deal. You know, they didn't <laughs> stop and say hello. Uh, but does the government know that they did stop and say hello? And to what extent do we know about them? And why do we know that they said hello? Did they actually visit us? Is there any kind of formal or informal relationship with who's here? 
you know, there's all these like conspiracy theories about, you know, at Holloman Air Force Base during the uh, Eisenhower administration, a craft landed and we made contact with uh, the occupants of the craft, so forth and so on. You know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories. One of the things I, I hope for this disclosure is to one thing is it may confirm what we think of conspiracy theories as true. And then it may then dispel some of the conspiracy theories as false. Now there'll be a falling uh, a falling out of some and actually a support of others. That it will like it's a cleansing effort by the U.S. government to come clean about what do we do know and uh, what NASA knows. Important point is what NASA knows, what the Department of Energy knows. That now we'll sort everything out, and who knows? You know, I mean. I listened to a uh, interview with Mick West on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, and you know, I, he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, based on his observations of what the government has publicly stated, there's nothing the government stated that would even support the notion of anything being non-human. Right. Right. They they try to cast it as um, it's explainable. We just don't have the explanation yet. And I believe that's what Errol's doing right now. But when disclosure, imminent disclosure happens and in post-disclosure world, um, you know, some of what Mick West says might be true. But a lot of things that we see might be something explainable. I'll mm -hmm. give you an example. A lot of people see like a triplet of lights flying very fast in the sky and say, ah, there's the TR-3B. I saw it, three lights in a triangle formation flying fast across the sky. See, TR-3B exists. But they may not know that the Chinese orbits in low Earth orbit, a satellite constellation used for reconnaissance, that's a triplet formation, just like that. And in low Earth or orbit, something that fast would just scream across. I mean, it goes by really quick. Um, and also, I would say in the US government, uh, we had satellites that flew in pairs together and also flew as triplets together. And the triplet, um, they actually, they were called spinners and they would spin on its axis. And it was like cylindrical and spun on its axis. And so when you're on the ground looking up and because the satellites dumped the data over the continental United States, right? Um, you look up and you say, oh my gosh, there's three of those and look, it's flashing. It's flashing. I'm getting a message that this is extraterrestrial. Um, it may not be. It may actually be a satellite, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I belabor the point, but, um, you know, not everything you see is going to be a UAP. But there are things that it, they're very difficult to explain that are UAP, that people have witnessed, that people have seen. I personally believe that, you know, what the our U.S. naval aviators saw were actual UAPs because I know we have nothing can do. The aerodynamic performance of what they saw does not exist in the inventory of the United States government or the inventories of other governments because they're wondering what they're seeing. You yeah. know, this time, you know, we were look, pointing at each other saying, ah, that's American technology, secret. We discovered it and we're going, ah, that's Russian technology and we discovered it. And then we find out that we're both thinking it's each other's technology and it's not. It's not even Chinese to that point. Yeah, interesting. There's a lot to break down from what you've said. I'm sure I'll have to go back over this and and dig back into it. But before I go, go on with any more of my questions, I'm just going to go to some of the questions from the live chat. Um, Red Panda Koala, thank you so much for the five dollars. Uh, he says, John, what role should the UFO community play in the coming months? Re disclosure. Uh, I would say this: um, it's going to be the post disclosure world that would be most important to we the civilians, and I count myself as we the civilians because I'm no longer employed by CIA and I have no clearances from CIA right. or any part of the U.S. government. And so I count myself as, you know, amongst those who are UFO or UAP enthusiasts. I just happen to have uh, have had a top secret SCI clearance where what I say is based on 
some factual information that I have to tailor to not violate my lifelong NDAs. There are lifelong NDAs. I, I agreed that I would never talk about, but given that, you know, I can talk about a lot. And in post-disclosure, um, I would say that we, if you're an American citizen or even a British citizen, that after post-disclosure, we need to press our governments, the representatives of the people to go forward and get more information out into the public domain. Because once we say it's non-human, we just removed a whole bunch of NDAs protecting this entire program. Not just the UAPs or UFOs, metamaterials, craft or parts of craft, but also, you know, there's NDAs protecting um, any kind of derivative craft that we may have built based on the original technology. So, okay, we won't talk about that. We'll keep our air forces happy that we won't talk about what's flying that they've developed. But let's talk about what crashed, landed, or was gifted to us. You know, let's talk about that. And you, we need to press our legislatures to provide more information and put pressure back onto our respective defense organizations to provide more information, particularly about who's flying the craft. If it's non-human, the next question I'm going to ask is, how do you know it's non-human? Who's flying the craft? Tell yeah. us more about who's flying the craft. And more importantly for me, why are they here? Yeah, intent. Why are they here? What is our role as humans in relationship to the people who are here? And so that's what the civilian community can do in post-disclosure. We won't have to worry about um, guessing whether it's real or something else. If we know it's real, this real phenomenon, the UAP phenomenon is real. If it's non-human, who are who might be at the controls and what do you know about them and why are they here? That will happen in post-disclosure. And that's something citizens can do. Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Appreciate it. This next one is actually two questions from two different people, but I'm going to link him to, to kind of formulate one. The first is from Glenn Harris, and he says, John, in your opinion, how much of a factor is religion in being a barrier to disclosure? Which I'm going to follow up with, what do you foresee the state of religion being after disclosure? Well, I think it's important that uh, the people who are uh, working on disclosure behind the scenes right now do reach out to the various belief systems on the planet because there is a potential of overturning these belief systems. Not only that, beyond that, uh, people who are um, in the business world, in the corporate world, of overturning the international markets that we now have. Uh, it could have ramifications above and beyond uh, what we foresee. There may be unintended consequences. So we need to bring the business corporate community in on this. We need to bring the religious community in on this. And I would also say we need to bring philosophers in on this and medical people in on this because people have been harmed by some exposure to UAPs. I mean, that's, that's a given. That's not a conspiracy theory. People have actually been harmed. By this, that was documented by um, the Kim Walkers at the Pentagon book by Dr. Lekatsky, Dr. Uh, Kelleher, and George Knapp. Yeah. That there were people who were associated with the investigation of Kim Walker, who had this hitchhiker effect and was also affected physically by that hitchhiker effect. So we need to bring medical people in on this as well. Um, and so, did I answer both questions? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, religion will survive beyond disclosure. I think yeah. it's been quite clear in recent years with the Vatican having conversations about, yes. you know, welcoming uh, non-human intelligence. So, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, I've got one more before we jump back to mine. This is from Diego. Thank you for the donation, Diego. Please ask Mr. Ramirez if he or anyone he knows have any official related documents they would like to contribute to the uh, National UFO Historical Records Center in New Mexico. Thank you. In fact, uh, I would say this, that uh, I know David Marler, I, I uh, communicate with David Marler. What he's doing is absolutely valuable. 
Agreed. Uh, he is archiving the historical records because when we go back after after we say, for example, let's say uh, the disclosure statement initially is non-human, and then when the questions arise from that statement, we need to tap into those resources that are in the civilian domain and get collate and gather those resources. In fact, the government should support his effort to do so because he has resources probably above and beyond what the government has. What the government has is information from the government. Yeah. They ignore the civilians, which they shouldn't, but they do. And the only time they look at um, civilians is when we, the formers, uh, when we're out of the office, have these encounters like I have. Uh, Mr. Semivan wrote about his encounters with beings in his bedroom. Yeah. So that shouldn't be ignored. And there he he's in his bedroom as Mr. Semivan, not Mr. Semivan, CIA officer. I was in my bedroom as me and not as a CIA officer. So I have information. He has information. Others in the intelligence community and in the military intelligence community they have information like that of these kind of encounters, but Doc, uh, Mr. Mahler has a tremendous amount of documented evidence. And we need to then collate, that is compare and collate the information the government has. Oh yes, we had a sensor that actually saw that. Go back the date time of that encounter with that sensor owned by the government. Go back and see what civilians might have witnessed in the same place at the same time the same date. That's the value of it. So um, I would say that, you know, that archive, um, there are archives at Rice University in in uh, Houston, Texas, here in the States. Um, we also and we also have the the government archives under the National Archives. So we have a lot of archive data that I think will provide a valuable resource in helping us understand this phenomenon in totality, not just from the perspective of an F-18 uh, uh, naval aviator who flew up against a Tic Tac, but also the people who have seen Tic Tacs, you know, yeah. in their own personal <laughs> lives. Let's go back and say, uh, did you actually, you know, U.S. government, did you actually have sensor data on these sightings? What do you know about them? Um, so that's the value of having um, that particular resource that uh, Mr. Marlin has painstakingly uh, took it on himself with very little funding, I might I add, to preserve. And that's a that's going to be a very valuable resource. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually going to be in Albuquerque myself at the end of June. I'm really hoping that I'm able to pay uh, David Mahler a visit. We, we shall see. Um, well, let's jump back to some of my questions. And something that's been, you know, talked about a lot in the last few months is this uh, these incursions over U.S. airspace. The Chinese spy balloon initially, followed by these three other objects. And it seems to be that even members of Congress are still not being briefed on what these other three objects were. So why do you think that is? And in your opinion, what do you think they may be? Well, that's very puzzling because um, I don't know what they are. I just know they're of such interest that they actually expended taxpayers' money to fly an F-16 or F pick a number from the U.S. Air Force inventory and spent money, uh, it's like $450,000 per Sidewinder missile <laughs> to shoot down something that probably, if it was a hobbyist balloon, cost like, you know, nothing. <laughs> yeah. Why did we do that? Well, I think some of it is optics um, that we knew that the Chinese were using surveillance balloons over our territory. If it's above 50 miles, it's open space. It's not sovereign U.S. airspace at all. It belongs to all nations, so they can fly something 50 miles and above. I don't know if that balloon was capable of that. Hmm. Uh, but the point being is that this balloon came down, came in lower in the atmosphere, um, and then it becomes part of U.S. Uh, sovereign airspace, and they need to respond to it. Um, I believe they detected these objects before because we have radars that can detect objects out in space and count satellites. So it's not a mystery to the Pentagon that here come the Chinese again. Uh, let's track it. Uh, but this one came down and was noted to have come down. And so they needed to respond to it. I don't know why they waited until it got to 
um, the East Coast and over the Atlantic to do something. Mm. Uh, they could have easily taken care of it um, over the U.S. landmass. Um, and, you know, out here, if you look at a map, I'm in Arizona and you'll be in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And one thing we have a lot of in our two states is desert. Empty right. desert. There, there, no one there except the coyotes and you know the other creatures who live out in the desert. So um, I don't know why they didn't shoot it down earlier. What they might be, I listened very carefully to the Pentagon spokesperson, this Brigadier General, who uh, represents the Public Affairs Office of the Pentagon. And then I listened very carefully to President Biden's speech about it. Yeah. Now. The Pentagon spokesperson said that it's unclassified, but he, no one questioned when can we see it, you know, show it to us. If it's unclassified, why won't you show us? Uh, I'm speaking particularly about the Alaska object. Right. Yeah. The Alaska object. That's the one that is of high strangeness because it was described as octagonal in shape, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not like a round balloon of some other shape. Um, so unclassified, but we can't see it. Why is that? Okay. And so he said, well, we don't know what they are. That's what the Pentagon statements. We don't know what they are, um, but this it was unclassified. And no, we're not going to show it to you. <laughs> and then so there's the Pentagon. And then President Biden goes and gives three explanations that the Pentagon never mentioned. And those are like, it could be a hobbyist balloon, you know, um, it could be a research balloon. Um, and so he gave explanations uh, of what it could be that the Pentagon never mentioned. And if it was a research balloon, if it was a hobbyist balloon or uh, a commercial balloon, something uh for a commercial purpose um that's unclassified yeah why can't we see it exactly <laughs> so you know it seems like there was a disconnect between how president biden was briefed about this incident versus what the pentagon knows about the incident versus what the executive branch of government told the legislative branch branch of government about these incidents so it's like three narratives and they're kind of incongruent, you know, like, yeah, the only thing that they concur is that it was something flying up in the air of interest and we had to shoot it down for whatever reason. And part of it is because there's such a, a uproar about the Chinese balloon that I believe the executive branch of government said, you know, we need to like respond, go find me some balloons to shoot down objects of convenience and opportunity. Go find me some balloons and let's shoot them down. That way we can say, by golly, you know, we're looking at the U.S. airspace and we are protecting you. We are the U.S. Air Force and nothing like that will happen. You can be safe, that you can be assured that we won't let anything like that fly over the United States. We have your back, United States citizen, you know. So maybe that's why they did it. But the one over Alaska is really strange. That's really strange because it was described as octagonal and there's no other information about it now uh on another podcast i did with chris leto who flew f-16s right you know I, I described that hey you know we know how to detect everything up there yeah we know what what's flying up there and the filter quote unquote filter that the pentagon said that the white house said um that filter is really you know getting our interest in the object where we were ignoring it before we're not paying attention to it that we've always seen these objects and now we have to pay attention to it that's the filter they just turned on the interest you know <laughs> before you didn't check this and it says you know report on balloons now you would check that report on balloons and so i think that's what happened yeah, I've uh, got a question here uh, just regarding this from Robbie again. Thank you, Robbie, for the donation. He says, do you think the recent shoot downs were because the military was testing and flying its secret aircraft that relate to what has not been disclosed? No. Mm -mm, no, absolutely not. Um, I know um, that's a very popular conception, 
but I will tell you what, it was secret aircraft, ours, uh, we wouldn't destroy it. <laughs> right. It would still fly. You wouldn't know that there was a secret aircraft. There would be no mention of a secret aircraft that we had to shoot down because we're not going to shoot down one of our secret aircraft. We won't do that. It's just so much money goes into these programs. Are we going to like destroy it with, um, you know, it sounds like a lot of money to most people, but $450,000 to the Pentagon is a rounding off era <laughs> at the end of the year. You know, yeah. we used to joke that, you know, millions of dollars for the NRO is a rounding off era because of the billions that they spend, the billions that CIA spends every year on intelligence. And so I don't think we would shoot anything down that belongs to us that is secret. And um, if it was an adversarial secret craft, there are ways to get it down without destroying it. Sure, sure. And I think this is the thing that we saw from it. I, you know, I was reporting uh, reporting on it and posting about it a lot at the time, and it spawned so many conspiracy theories about what these objects were, it's, you know, some very extreme ones. And so I think this uh, secrecy, this ongoing secrecy about what they were and the fact that Congress wasn't even briefed on it, it's just it multiplies those conspiracy <clears throat> theories and, and yet yes. we are still trying to, to to discuss it and work out what it is so it's understandable right. that people have so many questions sure and, and i would say congress um is saying they weren't briefed on it okay. i'll leave it at that I, I think that's a fair statement to say um the congress was it, members of congress uh were not disclosed what they were briefed on I mean, there have been some public statements from members of Congress mm -hmm. coming out of briefings, still frustrated that they haven't been told. So that that's kind of what I'm going yeah. on there. So. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But there, uh, the gang of eight will be thoroughly briefed on everything. Okay, that makes I need sense. to go into the gang of eight. They're the uh, the the heads and and the the chair and vice chair of the Senate and House Intelligence Committee chair and vice chair of the um, Senate and House Armed Services Committee, um, the Speaker of the House, and the lead member of the opposition party, which would be in our house, it would be the Democrats. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a gang of eight who, they are briefed on everything. Don't let anyone tell you that they don't know what's going on. They do. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I just wanted to switch it around now and talk about orbs, because in the past few years, orbs have been at the forefront of the conversation. We saw in Dr. Kirkpatrick's presentation to the, the committee that 50 plus percent of the cases that he's been working on are orbs. So do you have any kind of theory as to why orbs are suddenly so prevalent in the UFO subject? And, uh, um, you know, why, why is that kind of taken over from sources, Tic Tacs and triangles? Well, it's it's. It's seen a lot by civilians, for one thing. A lot of experiencers of orbs. I've experienced orbs myself. Yeah. Um, also, it's been seen in um, the imagery collected by the National Reconnaissance Office here as well through their sensors. Uh, when they deployed infrared sensors, um, they were able to see them, and they behaved in ways that uh, seemed to uh, not be... Uh, explainable, unexplained behaviors of extraordinary aerial uh, dynamic characteristics. And, you know, the exhibiting uh, Lou Elizondo's five observables, for example. And from my ex personal experience uh, working within the government, I do know that uh, when orbs were being detected, uh, there was a high amount of interest in these orbs. So people say, well, yeah, we knew about orbs from way back, you know. Civilians have detected, you know, all throughout the UFO history. Well, that's true. Uh, but we're talking about the government being interested because the government sensor detected it. It wasn't a, a report or a narrative or a story by someone in the civilian world. It was now, oh, my gosh, look what we found. And that a lot of resources were expended toward studying what these are. And that finished and right after that finished, all SAP started. Right. So what I described uh, was an under Title 50, the civilian side of intelligence community, and all SAP was part of the Title 10 
Defense Department side of the community, continuing on to ATIP. Yeah, that's interesting. So what can you tell me about the ORB working group? Uh, very little, uh, because <laughs> I refuse to be briefed on its inner workings. Uh, I did not want to be briefed on that. I was offered to be brought on that working group. Uh, I sent two of my engineers uh, to that working group. Um, they came back and asked me for a safe, which I ordered from the um, uh, the uh, General Services Administration, which provides safes for the U.S. government. Um, and so they were getting uh, courier to them a lot of compartment and information regarding uh, UFOs and orbs. And they were throwing them in the safe and I had no access to that information, except for when uh, one of my engineers haphazardly left one of the documents out. So I looked at the document and go, oh, that's interesting. And uh, then he came back and I'm sorry, boss. And then he grabbed it, turned it over and threw it in a safe. And so um, I can't say what the title was. because it, <laughs> it was classified, but I sure. do know what they looked at. Wow. And that gave me the hint uh, of a lot of things that I can't say. <laughs> but you'll be hearing about real soon now, I think, you know, more toward the end of the year, other people uh, with access, it might uh, be able to come forward about uh, what they know about not only ORS, but uh, the entire UFO program within the government itself. Um, I hope that that will occur. Excellent. Thank you for that. Now, I, I, it'd be remiss of me not to bring up the 2027 event that you have mentioned on on other shows. So I just wondered if you could just give us, uh, without going into too much detail, because I don't want you to have to keep repeating yourself, and right, you know, people can see it on other shows. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we know we know that um, the uh, 20, 2026, 2027 years have come up in the testimony and experiences and narratives of civilians. Uh, for example, Chris Bledsoe. Okay. Uh, has mentioned that. Uh, you mentioned Anjali before. Anjali has, has mentioned that. And others have, as well have mentioned about some interest in these areas. I was asked about what do you, did I know about that? Because um, it was something that came on, up on their radar. They Who's they? Funny. Sorry? I can't say who. Oh, okay. Okay. I can't say who. Um, and But it was in a... Uh, Skiff. Now I read in social media uh, that here I am uh, illegally saying something that occurred in a skiff. So I have no clearances, folks, zero. And I was in a skiff and they are not sharing classified information with me. They asked me for an opinion. And my opinion was, gee, I know that that's been coming up in a lot of discussion in the civilian UFO community. You know, that something will occur. But the fact that they knew about it led me to believe that they were paying attention to that to that year. Because they asked me what I knew about it. And I said, what I know is what you know. You know, we have, and I mentioned Chris Bledsoe by name, an experiencer in North Carolina. Chris Bledsoe, you know that a lot of, you know, former intelligence community officers, if not current, intelligence community officers with clearances visited him. Why did that happen? You know, and look at that. Why did Chris Bledsoe all of a sudden, out of all the folks out there, gain the attention of extremely senior people in the intelligence community? Look into that. Uh, but in my opinion, I would say because of the pace of what we're seeing in our skies occurring, that they have an opportunity to come down and visit us perhaps by 2027, maybe that will occur. Okay. And my cue was what Lou Elizondo said in 2022, that wait five years and it'll all come out. Everything will come out in five years. And in the meantime, go find a hobby and forget about this. And then come back in 2027, right? Five years from 2022 is 2027. And I mentioned that as well. And so that's the context of 2027. I have no clearances. It is not illegal for me to say something that may have occurred in the skiff, but I have no clearances. So we didn't discuss anything that was like classified or where I need a clearance for. I didn't get read into anything. And I refuse to have any clearances because that is a headache to have <laughs> these clearances. I don't want that intrusion into my life. Okay. In order to obtain a clearance and to maintain it, I do not want to go through polygraphs. 
I do not want to have my background investigated investigation occur all the time. So I, I'm done with that life. I left it behind on September 30, 2009. So what I discuss was unclassified in that environment. No, I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think, you know, that's interesting that you say that maybe later this year we'll get acknowledgement from the government and then maybe it's the non-human intelligence's chance in 2027 to, you know, to get it from their side of things. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, John, I th again, this is something that, uh, that I wanted to bring up with you and get your thoughts on, and that is the whole uh, history and current work ongoing at Skinwalker Ranch. I'd just love to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I I was uh, I, I was aware of Skinwalker Ranch mostly because I listened to Coast to Coast AM, even yeah. when Art Bell hosted it. And Skinwalker Ranch has come up as a topic on Coast to Coast AM, and that's how I knew about it. I did not know about it in any way, shape, or form officially while I was serving in the government. So my my take on it is that it's a place of some kind of energy field, if you will. I don't know, um, but it seems that it has an effect on people and that people see things. Um, it was written in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon that the observers who were government observers felt like there was a presence there. And so what is that? I don't know. I do know in Arizona, um, in Sedona and other parts of Arizona, perhaps in New Mexico as well, that there are places called uh, vortex places, vortices, that people seem of uh, people who have uh, intuitive gifts are able to sense some kind of energy coming from it. It's just that Skinwalker, it seems to have been negative energy coming from Skinwalker. So I, I have no explanation for it. There's a lot of legend from the native lore of the Americas about these kind of places. So I would encourage people to look up what the natives have written about the Skinwalker. And that's why it's named Skinwalker, because that, that wasn't something that um, the owners uh, of Skinwalker Ranch or um, anyone made up. You know, it, they didn't make that name up. Um, Robert Bigelow didn't make up the name Skinwalker. It was something that was in the lore of the Native American peoples of that area that there was something called a skinwalker and they have an entire legend and myth about it. So read about that. And they themselves self said that it was something of a spirit. Um, and so that's what I know about it. Um, I think it warrants further investigation. And I'm, I know that, you know, it's happening. Okay. It's happening through an entertainment medium, but that's fine because a lot of people get their information through entertainment. And so that's fine if they want to do an entertainment kind of show around Skinwalker, that's fine. But um, I don't give it much thought uh, as well as other people. Um, uh, I just think, you know, you put it in the category of high strangeness. There's a lot of high strangeness around the world. And I put it in that category, um, but it doesn't affect me personally. I just find it intellectually curious that there is such a thing as Skinwalker Ranch with those effects. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of the same thing. You know, I find it interesting. I think it warrants more uh, investigation. I'm happy as well that it's on an on a entertainment show. It doesn't necessarily put me off. Uh, we hear that the, the science is being done, so I kind of withhold judgment for now on mm -hmm. the quality of what they're doing. But, yeah, it's, it's certainly a fascinating place. Um, well, John, I've used up all my questions. I've got a couple more from the chat, so we'll, we'll mm -hmm. get into them. Uh, Ken Brett, I don't know if you were meant to put a question down, but thank you for the $5.50 anyway. Um, a question from Chris Tyne. John, have you had any recent personal experiences that you're okay with sharing? The most recent personal experience I've had occurred on my birthday, July 14, 2020. And that was when I saw an orb over our mountain range here in Tucson, Arizona. It's called the Catalina Mountain Range, over one peak known as the Bighorn mountain and we had a ce6 that is close encounters of the sixth kind it is um, a amplification of the fifth kind that uh, dr greer uh, has taught and practices uh, with his audience the sixth kind uses radios to communicate and in this instance there was a researcher by the name of mark sims who's worked with another researcher named 
Jimmy Blanchett using radios as a means of communication. And in this instance, there was a global CE6 event. It's called Harmonic Convergence 2020. And on my birthday, um, my wife and I joined Mark Sims. Um, it was over um, the internet. So we had our, um, our phones on and I streamed it over my little speaker, my Bluetooth speaker. And there Mark Sims went through his modality um, and he took a message that he created and used something called Photo Sounder, which takes graphics and converts it into sound. And he broadcast it over his radio and we all meditated. And during the meditation, and I was looking up over the mountains, all of a sudden this bright object appeared. It wasn't an airplane. It wasn't a meteor. It was nothing like that. It was a bright object that was glowing white. And it was an orb. It wasn't like a star or anything like that. Hmm. It was all of a sudden a white disc appearing over there. Very, very bright. Very, very bright. Almost crystalline bright. And that's where I received the message that, John, you have things that you know about us. And it's time for you to share what you know. And also, you're, you are to help an individual with questions they have about us. And so with that message, which I got and my wife didn't, I saw it straight ahead of me. My wife saw it to her right. And she didn't see this glowing orb. She saw a light to her right simultaneously with my sighting. So I knew that this was for me, not for her. It was meant for me. My wife, by the way, has seen orbs of orange that yeah. I did not see, that when I showed up, they disappeared. So that was her orbs. Uh, but my personal orb, which I call my personal orb, I got that message. And I so happened to have um, in my computer files an, an old briefing I gave when I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, an old briefing that breaks out the entire intelligence community. And the audience was with a UFO group, a, a meetup in the UFOs for UFOs called Cosmic Empowerment. And I gave, presented that briefing way back when, in 2016. And I dusted it off and I decided, you know, I, I want to use that and add on to it more recent information. And because I'm a CIA officer, if I want to go public with it, this was a private meeting of just about how the intelligence community was organized. And it's all like open source. But now I want to add to it. And so I finished the briefing, sent it to CIA for their review. And they came back saying, we don't endorse what you have in your slides, but your slides are unclassified. And I also sent it to Jim Simivan, to Richard Dolan, and to Whitley Strieber, and to other folks that you know that are out there, um, out in the community, uh, doing these podcasts. So they also knew about the content of my slides. Um, and so I did present it uh, with uh, our friend, you know, Jay Anderson of Project Unity. Yep. And that's where I presented it. Um, I most recently presented it um, close. Uh, I updated it, uh, streamlined it, and represented that to an organization in MUFON called Main Mainline MUFON. Right. And I believe that link is out there, out there uh, on YouTube now. And that is a little bit more of a refinement and an update of that original presentation. So that's what I know, and what I know is what I'm doing with you now. I am doing what I believe was sent here to do is to help with people understanding who they are, why, they, why they're why they here. Um, I'll let the what they are and how they got here, leave that up to the physicists working on this. There's a lot of physicists working on this. Um, people say, you know, do we actually know how the Tic Tac flies? By golly, you know who they should listen to? Dr. Jack Sarfati. Jack Sarfati. He knows how the Tic Tac works. And there's a video explaining to us, the non-physicists, how they work, and it makes so much sense. 
And it's probably close to like how they really work. And it's, you know, it people think, oh, you need like this anti-gravity like thing that can't exist because it breaks all the laws of physics and so forth. But if you listen to Dr. Jack Safardi, he will explain to you how Tic Tac works. And so um, that's my, my mission. My goal is to help with this disclosure of who they are, why they're here. That to me is more important than how they got here and any razzmatazz about their craft and how they fly. I don't care about that. They're here. And so why? What, what lessons do you have for us? And I believe it's exactly what people have seen um, in the narrative, that they're here because they're concerned about our stewardship of the planet. We're doing a terrible job of being stewards of their planet, which we share with them. And they've been here perhaps longer than we have. And perhaps we are their children. And they look at us like children, like the parent looking at the children. And we are finding matches, playing with matches, and we might set the whole darn place on fire. That's nuclear warfare. They don't want that to happen. And they want us to be better stewards of our climate, um, the way we treat each other. I think that's very important that we understand if we see them, if they present ourselves, we understand that, hey, you know, our differences as humans on this planet, just because of skin color or where you were born and how much money you have, that will all disappear. That will all disappear. And I want that to disappear because then we will become enlightened. We'll, our consciousness will be raised and we will have the potential of being a space faring planet to join them in the peaceful exploration of space to join with them. And that's a Star Trek kind of vision, <laughs> but I'm a big Star Trek fan. And I hope that that is what's going to occur. Yeah. Listen, thank you so much for sharing your experience and for the whole interview in general. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for clarifying certain points. As John stated at the start, you um, can look forward to a, an upcoming interview where him and Anjali are going to appear together and, you know, again, further clarify some of the conversation and confusion that may be occurring across UFO Twitter and other places. But for now, everyone in the live chat, thank you so much. Oh, I see Davey there. Thank you for the donation, my friend. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, I will be back this Wednesday where my co-host, Katie Howland will be joining me and we will also be joined by Matt Ford of The Good Trouble Show and Christopher Sharp. So join us then. For now, everyone, take care and see you soon. Goodbye.